Yes. All right. Um, so I didn't prepare, you know, something very, you know, very formal or, or very elaborate. I, I kind of, uh, these will just be a few ramblings about the things that, you know, came to mind um, regarding the nuclear equation of state, which is what I was asked to sort of summarize. Um, so I guess the first thing that I wanted to point out is just kind of the slew of different observations that are starting to probe the EOS. Uh, and we've heard about many of these, but you know, if you look at this list, this is quite an impressive list of different, various different kinds of observations that are starting to probe the nuclear EOS. And I think one of the interesting things is that many of these are giving us new results only in the last few years, right? So NICER obviously has produced incredible results uh, in the past year or so. Um, obviously LIGO Virgo uh, with 170817 and, uh, and subsequent detections, although those are not you know, actually very constraining for the US, but, but certainly 170817. Um, all of the multi-messenger work, which we haven't heard too much about, but basically using gravitational waves in combination with the electromagnetic signatures to, to probe the EOS. So this is sort of you know similar to, for example, what uh, David was just showing us, if, if we're able to use the radio afterglow uh, light curve to distinguish between equations of state, that would be, that would be amazing. Um, and then also, you know, the traditional field of just pulsar mass measurements. Uh, we had this uh, incredible discovery of the most massive, well-measured pulsar, um, this uh, Cromer T pulsar that has a, a mass of 2.1-ish solar mass. And so all of these are just, you know, within the last couple, two, three, four years. Um, so I think that's maybe a point that's worth appreciating, just, you know, even when it seems that we're lost and we're not totally getting as great a handle as we might want to on, on these parameters, there's been a huge amount of progress in the last few years. Um, also, just to point out that you know there's another other types of experiments that we haven't really discussed in this meeting, um, you know, for good reason because none of us here are probably experts on this. But there are also laboratory experiments that are probing this as well. So, for example, PREX also just came out with uh, new results, um, and uh, and that's starting to probe uh, the EOS at at kind of very different scales. Um, I should also say, by the way, if anyone has comments, questions, jump in. I, I kind of structured this in a way that was supposed to raise questions. So this is what we have at the moment. What do we have in the future? Um, so, you know, perhaps the most exciting for all of us is, is um, the Einstein telescope or other third generation gravitational wave detectors. And, you know, what, if you ask ourselves, what can we hope to do with that um, besides, you know, seeing BNSs to larger distances, obviously, uh, getting a larger sample size. Um, so it's been shown uh, by Show Me Day, Duncan Brown, and others that, you know, perhaps the only hope for us to actually get measurable tidal effects is to wait for 3G detectors. So again, this is going back to the point that was discussed earlier in this workshop um, that you know, 170817 gives us really great constraints. It's a very high SNR, very close by event. We got super lucky. But even for 170817, we can't actually formally distinguish between a binary neutron star and a binary black hole from the perspective of gravitational waves alone. Obviously, we know that 170817 was a binary neutron star um, from the electromagnetic counterparts, but you know, from the gravitational waves alone, there actually isn't any measurable tidal effect. Um, and of course, we'd like that if we want to actually measure the radius and, and constrain it to a much better degree. Um, so basically, this goes back to you know some debates that Wolfgang was having with with others, with Salvatore and others, about whether you can exclude low tidal deformability. And I think the conclusion is, since you know, since formally we can't distinguish between a binary black hole and a binary neutron star, then the answer is no. We can't we can't exclude zero tidal deformability for this event. And Perhaps we have to wait to Einstein telescope until we can. Um, what else can we do with the Einstein telescope? Uh, I think one of the things that at least I'm the most excited about is to detect post-merger gravitational waves. Um, I think that's incredibly exciting because it gives a unique probe of um, the post-merger remnant, and in particular, uh, you know, the massive uh, neutron star remnant that is hot. Uh, so this is kind of probing a unique parameter space of uh, the equation of state, uh, the hot equation of state, uh, also on the very massive neutron star end. Um, and also it, it 
in principle could provide you know a direct means of measuring the collapse time and the stability of the remnant uh, that is sort of you know a difficult question that we're trying to grapple with you know with various other means at the moment um, and then i also mentioned precise mass ratio measurements uh, which is more important if you know you want to know the individual component masses for population studies and things like that all right so just zooming in on you know LIGO and and uh, nicer uh, you know we had this very nice uh, kind of uh, cage match between Nils and Cole uh, I'm kidding though no, it, it wasn't a cage match it was all very civil but you know um, they were sort of debating which of these uh, uh, will provide better constraints on the US um, and I think one of the conclusions was that uh, at least the point of view of, of, of Cole and I think Nils as well is that LIGO will uh, overtake nicer in terms of constraint on the radius of canonical 1.4 solar mass neutron star uh, once the sample size of events is you know several or tens of events but it won't be able to do so for massive neutron stars so um, again this is Cole's point of view which I, I personally agree with um, nicer will probably continue to be the only uh, instrument that will be able to constrain the radius of heavy two solar mass neutron stars and again, this is a point that wasn't, I think, elaborated on too much. Um, so just to kind of drive home why this is the case. Um, and the reason that's the case is because uh, the tidal deformability of a two solar mass neutron star is about 10 times smaller than that of a 1.4 solar mass neutron star. So, um, and the reason is because the tidal deformability just scales so strongly with mass. Um, and so, you know, we're having a very hard time measuring actually measuring tidal deformability of canonical 1.4 solar mass neutron stars. At the moment, it's certainly hopeless that we'll ever measure uh, the tidal deformability of a two solar mass neutron star. Um, not to mention the fact that we don't know how common these objects actually are, you know, in merging BNSs um, in, in the universe. So we don't know basically uh, the population and whether nature will be kind enough to even provide us with such neutron stars uh, that merge. Uh, obviously from the galactic population, we know that these aren't uh, the types of neutron stars that are in binaries, um, but uh, but LIGO is starting to show that perhaps the extragalactic population differs a little bit. Um, and then this begs the question, you know, kind of the whole golden uh, or sort of gold standard of what we're trying to do uh, with measuring neutron star radius and sampling or constraining the equation of state is basically to measure the mass radius diagram, right? So it can show, for example, this crude mass di mass a small picture of a mass radius diagram here. And, you know, having the radius of a 1.4 solar mass neutron star is, is great, um, particularly since most mass radius diagrams for different EOS kind of, you know, turn over um, and don't have a huge variation in their radius for different masses. Uh, but in principle, you know, if you want to really understand the full equation of state and you want to be able to invert mass radius into pressure density, then you need to sample this mass radius diagram. Uh, namely, you need to get different measurements of radius at different masses. And it's not obvious how well we'll be able to do that, if at all. Um, all right, let's see what else. Oh, okay, so next rambling. Uh, so this is moving more on to the theory that side and some things that we've heard. So um, I think one of the cool things that caught my attention that we heard about is this cool new prescription for finite temperature effects, um, basically extending cold equations of state to uh, finite temperature. And of course, this is important for mergers because merger remnants actually do reach temperatures of tens of MeV. Um, and so you can't completely ignore the thermal effects. Um, but I think that, you know, one thing that I haven't heard enough about and that I don't think that we still fully understand um, so this is a provocative statement, perhaps. Uh, I'm waiting for the numerical relativists, relativists in the room to maybe shout at me. But you know, I'd like to ask, do we really fully understand thermal effects or lack of thermal effects, basically? Does thermal pressure have any impact? Does it not? How does it impact things? So there's been recent work starting to investigate this, but I don't think we fully understand the problem yet. Um, and uh, you know, just to, just to show how bad or how, you know, basically to show how bad things are, I don't even, I'm not even confident that we have a qualitative understanding in the sense of whether or not thermal pressure stabilizes the remnant or destabilizes the remnant. Um, so naively, you might think that thermal pressure adds just 
you know, additional pressure component, so it, it would stabilize it. Um, but in fact, uh, there's old work by Kaplan et al. that shows that in principle, um, it might be that thermal pressure actually destabilizes the remnant uh, for various reasons. Uh, one reason is that, you know, pressure is also energy density in general relativity. And so you basically add more mass uh, to the remnant um, and, you know, can cause it to collapse for that reason. Another reason that is perhaps more important and less esoteric is the fact that uh, if you stare at this figure, you see that the remnant, the merger remnants, this is from uh, um, simulations by uh, Vasilis Pascalidis and, and Rathel, Carolyn Rathel. And so if you stare at this figure, you see that the regions that are hottest in the post-merger remnant are sort of the outer layers um, of the neutron star. And so you can imagine that what this actually does to the neutron star is it doesn't really add much support to the center. Uh, again, you can see this from this ratio of the thermal pressure to the cold pressure basically doesn't add much to the central energy uh, pressure, but it does inflate the neutron star. So by as adding a lot of pressure to the external layers, you can create an inflated neutron star that's very large um, and therefore it can't rotate as fast and you might lose rotational support. So that could actually destabilize it. So all of this has you know, been discussed to some extent, but I don't think we fully understand that yet. And again, I'm waiting for people to maybe shout at me and tell me that I'm wrong about this. But, um, but I think this is a point for discussion. Um, let's see. The other point that's related to this is, you know, kind of a bit more of a, an open-ended kind of conceptual question. You know, we currently and probably will always be, be limited to only, you know, a handful, maybe a few dozen or so equations of state that we're able to simulate um, using full-scale, you know, GRMHD simulations um, if we want to simulate binaries with different parameters, um, different masses, mass ratios, etc. And so the question, kind of conceptual question, is how do we systematically explore in, a, in principle infinite degree parameter space, right? This is a pressure energy density um, phase space that has infinite degrees of freedom. How do we explore it with only a finite uh, set of equations of state that are kind of chosen ad hoc based on convenience? Um, so the approach that, you know, most of us have taken in this field, myself included, is to kind of assume that, you know, perhaps the most important aspects or facets of this infinite degree parameter space are kind of just a few global properties, such as um, the radius of a 1.4 solar mass neutron star or the maximum mass of neutron stars. So basically, maybe you can encapsulate a lot of these effects uh, of this infinite degree parameter space in just a few uh, qualitative uh, global properties. And I think that's, you know, a reasonable way to get at this problem, but it's not obvious that that's, that will provide the full solution. And I think it's still an open-ended question whether or not you can create some edge cases that don't really conform to what we naively think. So I think I prepared some more slides, but um, I'm actually happy to stop here and, and I'm just open for questions, discussion. I, I didn't really intend this to be sort of a formal presentation, just more of you know, food for thought. Thank you very much. I think, uh, and thank you for staying pretty much on time. Um, okay, so we are open to questions now. Um, first of all, let's thank the speaker and, you know, clap uh, electronically. And we're ready for some questions. So I'm waiting. Okay, I so I see David and then Brian. Unfortunately, I don't know who was first in raising the hand. So I'm going to go to um, David and then Brian. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just really actually wanted to make a comment to this. Uh, I agree very much with what uh, Ben just said about uh, the fact that we don't know very well thermal effects and uh, that we struggle to explore the parameter space. And that is why I think it's very important that apart from equations of state that maybe have the best possible physics, everything, that we also consider equations of state that are parameterized like the equations of state that Caroline presented uh, uh, because this really allows us to explore things and understand whether these uh, global properties are really what governs the dynamics or whether uh, we find the universal relation simply because all of the equations of state have built-in correlations that we are not uh, taking into account when we do our, our analysis. So. Okay. Yeah, I agree. 
Okay, so the next is Brian and then Scott. I don't want to take too long because I was mainly only speaking because at first I didn't see anyone else raise their hand. Uh, uh, you didn't say much about uh, phase transitions. I know that has a whole extra uh, uh, quirk to all this. Um, so, so what are your views uh, on you know the relative importance of single neutron star observations versus mergers to constrain uh, phase transitions? Yeah, I'm I'm definitely not an expert on that. So uh, I, you know, um, maybe others in the room can jump in. I know that uh, that several people here have thought about this in greater detail. My personal view is that, you know, probably mergers are more promising um, than individual, you know, neutron star mass measurements or, or nicer radius mass measurements, uh, radius measurements. Um, just from the point of view that you know the merger remnant is very massive, and so you can reach much higher densities. And so if you if you do have phase transitions, um, the most promising or optimistic way to probe that and reach the phase transition is by measuring properties of the post-merger remnant. That's very massive, um, kind of the highest density regime that you can think that we might be able to access. And that goes back to the point of measuring these uh, post-merger gravitational wave signals. And I think Vasily has done some work on this and uh, and uh, Andy Bauslein and, and perhaps David as well. Uh, I forget um, some of these references, but um, I know that people have looked at, you know, the impact of phase transitions on the post-merger gravitational waves, for example. Yeah, I, I just had one more thing. I mean, I, I, I agree with you that seeing the post-merger phase, I think if we see the oscill oscillations from the remnant, at least we know it survived the, the first bounce, as David mentioned. Um, I, I, from, from talking to people, though, it sounds like it will be harder to actually determine the lifetime if it's significantly longer than the time over which uh, the oscillations decay away. Um, so, so I, I, I ideally it would be great to actually see you know the thing oscillating and collapsing. Um, I'm not sure how realistic that is or how how high of a signal to noise event we will need. Um, but I'm, I'm no, <laughs> I, I agree. I think I think though even the simpler problem of you know discerning the threshold between prompt collapse and you know having a single bounce. We have we have our numerical relativity simulations that tell us where that threshold should lie, more or less. Um, but you know, it's not obvious that that's exactly what nature does. And and again, that also provides a handle on the equation of state. Um, and so and so, I think even that is is very important. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Scott, for a quick question, and then we take a break, and then Scott will be the first speaker after the break. Uh, yeah, super quick question. So earlier on, you said that um, post-merger evolution will probe the hot, massive uh, sector. Um, I mean, that's not like like quark gluon plasma sort of regime, right? No, no, no. Um, this isn't. Yeah, no. So this uh, is hotter, hotter than cold. Yes, right? we're talking about okay. tens of MeV, which means that you can't completely ignore the thermal pressure, but this is nowhere near uh, quark gluon plasma. Um, okay. Yes. Thanks. Okay, great. So uh, we are only running nine minutes late this morning. 